Welcome to government class. I'm going to tell some about myself. It's important for me to know my students, it's important to know the audience, but it's important for you to know <laughs> who is this knucklehead? Well, so I'm going to talk to you about my credibility. My credibility is A. Becca Book Publishing. So we have a government book and they have information and they have questions. So the main part of what you're going to learn that's going to equip you to score big in college is to do the assignments in the book that I give you with the questions. And the, the whole point is that you're reading it, and then you're going to the questions that ask what's important. You go back, you fill in the information, you're going to put that on a piece of paper, you have a binder, something like that, you're going to bring it every week and show me that you did the assignment. What will happen is, if you do this ABECA book, and you go to college and you take a government class, you'll already be a cut ahead of the vast majority of people who are going to be in that college setting with you. We discovered that with uh, some people who have just recently graduated college. I did this class a few years back, and the teachers were going, oh, where did you guys get this? This is so, wow, you, know, you guys could teach this class. And all they did is really take what they learned out of that ABECA book, but it, A. Becca goes back into the fundamentals of why the government is the way it is, the inspiration behind it, rather than just merely giving you a slew of noisy facts. So my credibility for being effective in this class lies in your fulfilling the assignments that you see in A. Becca book. Now, not only that, as a bonus, uh, years ago, I think it was uh, 15, 16 years ago, I went on a quest to discover how to obey God and man at the same time. How do you, how do you reconcile men's laws with God's laws? And I found out that God's laws show up in the laws of men, that God is still influencing our civil institution. He still has a huge deliberate plan for his blessing us and benefiting us. And what I found is... I had this thing called, it's a law encyclopedia, American Jurisprudence, 80 volumes, 80 plus volumes. And I began to read it, sort of like a novel. And the, uh, what I discovered was, in every aspect of law, of course, it's government law, you know, they're, they're combined. I found out that once I knew the word of God, I could predict what the law would say. And, and it really, I can tell you, in fact, there's times that people would ask me a question, and I would tell them what the law was out of a biblical precept without ever having read the law. And then I went, I said, well, let me just go get some references, you know? And I go check American jurisprudence, and guess what? It was already in stake. So really, God's law, his word that has been revealed, his law that was revealed in the Holy Bible still is having its effect on the world we live in, particularly in law. And when you see the laws of men go contrary to this, you see catastrophe connected to it. So that's my history. Um, so really, my credibility lies in this ABECA book and the fact that years ago I began to study law and, I, and use it. And that was it. Short and sweet. Now, does anybody have any questions about the class or anything else about what I've said so far? Feel free to do it. Because I'm going to call on Hunter any time that people don't ask a question. No, I'm lying, actually. So we're going to, um, we're going to, who, okay, I gave the assignment, it said read pages four through seven in chapter one. The reason why is I wanted the first week to be kind of an intro, and we're going to get a little less monologue here in a minute, hopefully. And I wanted you guys to read and do the questions on number, pages four through seven. And what you'll do is at the end of the class, you show it to me and I'm going to initial the rest of you who had, did not get that initial assignment will have to do that and then get it back to me next week and I'll initial it and I'll just check that stuff. So, the big question, and here's a, another monologue statement. There's a term in scripture that says righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And that's in the scripture. And what you're going to see in life is that the consequences of our depraved society and our consequences of of acting contrary to the law that was already revealed in the Bible and shows up in the laws of men, the more we do that, the greater catastrophe we'll have in our society, in our community, in our economic situation. There's a lot of things that we've been doing in the last couple of decades that are having massive effects on your pocket 
at this moment. And so we'll be talking about that during the class. So one of the things in your handout, and by the way, it said this in your book, um, this was in your textbook. One of the phrases it says is that it's imperative for us to know God's word, to believe it and do it. So that's going to be that basically the entire <coughs> class, we're going to be taking the textbook, we're going to be taking um, the Constitution of the United States, we're going to be looking at the Constitution of Virginia, and we're also going to be reading the things that the founders were reading. You know, did they just come up with this? They were just illuminated on how to make a government. No, they actually were being influenced by other people. We're going to read from those people who are influencing the founders of this nation. So, here we go. Um, now, real quick, again, is there's, I need to make sure there's a textbook in front of everybody. So we've got one there, right? You've got two there. And Sarah, have you got a textbook? No. Okay. It's in the mail. It's in the mail. Okay, but you did get the printout, pages four through seven. Okay, well, since this is my first start, I've got my, my little outline that I was gonna follow, and I made a diverge here just because not everybody got the assignment. Um, okay, so this is what I'm gonna do. The big thing I said, and somebody thought it was a trick question. What, is the, what does the Bible say is the purpose of government? Um, and is there anybody that didn't get that assignment? I need to know. Was that? Okay, Hunter was the only one. Everybody else got that assignment. Okay, Mariah, what does the Bible say is the purpose of government? I have like a big paragraph. Do you want me to read it? Yeah. Okay. The basic function of human government instituted by God is protection, punishment, and something else. What's it say? What's the spelling? P-R-O-M-O-T-I-O-N. Promotion. When Adam sinned, it was pretty obvious that civilians would need some sort of rules to protect people from themselves. An example is seen in Acts 21, 27, to 34, when Roman soldiers stepped in and saved Paul from being murdered by his enraged people in Jerusalem. Function of punishment. Paul and Peter bring this out. Paul... Paul writes that duly appointed human officials are to be regarded as God's servants to bear the sword, that is, to impose punishment to criminals. Peter says that governors are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. That's 1 Peter 2, 13 to 14. And lastly, the function of promotion. Human government is to promote the general welfare of the community where his laws are in effect. Paul commands us to pray for human leaders that we may lead a quiet, peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. First Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2.1-15. Wow, that's funny. You know, where did you, what was your reference? My Bible. It came out of your Bible? It was the commentary in your Bible? And what's the publisher? Well, it wasn't this Bible. It okay. Was Some other one. Okay. Well, actually, promotion comes neither from the east nor the west nor the south, but God is a judge. He sets one up and he puts down. I, I just said that. Is hopefully I'll say some shocking things. Um, he, he said the government's purpose was to promote. Well, ultimately, the promotion comes from God. It's, so we're going to see how that works together. Yes. Was that a summit on the email that you sent? Yes. And... Was it, when it did, was it to answer one of the questions that were asked in the book? No, it was. What, okay, we'll, we'll just hold that thought. I want to go to that question. Somebody else have, what's the Bible say the purpose of government? Out of what you looked up. I, I also Okay, go ahead. Um, there are many references in the Bible that explain the purpose of government. In the book of Romans chapter 13, Paul tells us that we are to be subject to the governing authorities because God himself instituted their authority. Now that doesn't mean we must do whatever the government says. There are scriptures that allow for disobedience in cases where obedience contradicts God's law. Uh, but a few references. And where did you, yeah, what, did you find, are those this your is, words? This is or all your, my Bible. Okay, it came out of your like, commentary, or you actually are just, making comments based on scriptures? These, I, I read Romans 13, Okay. and then 
I read, um, there was one little thing that did remind me of, you know, Paul saying to be subject to him, but he said, but God also does allow disobedience to the government when if you do obey, obey the government, it contradicts God's law. Okay. So it, it gave, uh, you know, reference to Daniel, and then there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. And, um, and then later it says, Paul explains that government is supposed to be a, is supposed to be generally a blessing. Without it, there will be anarchy. Government is a servant of God in carrying out his wrath on evil rulers for our good. We also need to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and pay taxes. Okay, everybody open to Romans chapter 13. I read it New King James this morning. Ah, good. Oh, this is New King James. Somebody has a, a King James. Is somebody going to read? Is anybody here reading King James? Okay. Let me know if you are, because I want to know if one of the words are different. Romans 13. Let every soul, that's the living person, you, be subject to the governing authorities. I've seen some translations say power. And the word is in the Greek, it's important, it's exosia, it's authority. And we're going to be discussing throughout this time, there's a difference between power, or force, and authority. And this is my maxim, I don't know that I've ever read this, but I've kind of connected the dots here. If you heard the term tyranny, tyranny, most people think, oh, it's just when the guy in power does something that makes you uncomfortable, you know? It's contrary to what the will of the people is, or whatever. Well, it could be that the the, the democracy is acting, trying to be in tyranny. And what tyranny is, is the exercise of power without authority. Exercise of power without authority. Say, for instance, if a, you may not know this, but in the Constitution they have this thing about search and seizure. Well, if somebody kicks in your door without a warrant and goes seizes something, they've exercised their power. They had that power to kick in your door. But they didn't have the authority to do it. That would be an example of tyranny. So when you hear the term tyranny, and when you start to review what the founders were talking about, tyrannical government, what they meant was you're exercising this force that you have, but it's actually against the law. And it's not just the law that the democracy came up with. It's the law that was revealed from the very beginning in the Bible. So if you're doing something contrary to this, nobody has the authority to do something contrary to this. So if they use their power contrary to this, it's tyranny. If they do something contrary to just, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at some of the things the founders were reading, but that's what tyranny would be. So take that for your notes. Go ahead and write that down. It's going to be an important aspect of American government. Tyranny. You can use the word use or exercise of force without authority. Exercise of force without authority. So going back to Romans 13, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. They're promoted by God doesn't come from the east nor the west nor the south, but God is a judge. Therefore, whoever resists the authority, that's lawful. If it's the authority, it's going to be acting lawfully, absolutely. It resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be afraid, unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is, and this is where I wanted to tell you, what is the purpose of government according to the Bible? Matthew mentioned it, and uh, Mariah mentioned it. For he is God's minister, in verse 4, to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to ex execute wrath on him who practices evil. So ultimately, the summary is, the purpose of government is to be, and, and for those in governing authorities, they're to be a ministry of God. It's actually fulfilling a ministry of God. So guess what? Government is insanely important. And we in America have, just from my observation, have abandoned our obligation to ensure that government is literally godly and that they're rewarding those who do good. 
and punishing those who do bad. Okay? For your protection and for the sake of your little brothers and sisters. So their government's role is to be a minister of God for our good. Now, in your handout, uh, there was one of the subjects that were being talked about was limited government. Does somebody have any, uh, that's not 719, is it? 224. Does anybody have, can somebody explain to me in your own words before I call on Nick, uh, what is limited government? Now, Nick, you didn't get the assignment, so you didn't read it, right? Well, um, I thought you, I thought what I read was one through four, but it was what I was supposed to read, so I did get it. Oh, you did do it. Okay. So I may just call on Nick. What is, in there, we, it talked about limited government. What is limited government? They said limited government exercising, oh, I won't tell it where it says, what is limited government? What do they mean when they were talking about limited government in there? That's an aspect of American government. They, they were saying, I'm going to let somebody else besides Matthew and Mariah, because I picked on you guys. And that probably won't pick on the auditor. Does anybody know what limited government is? Oh. Okay, Nick. I got to have Great a book. Great volunteer. Great. I got to have a book. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, a limited government is a is a government that exercises its power under restriction, usually by means of a constitution. Okay, that's good. That's an important thing. Notice it says restricts government. One thing that's important about Virginia government in particular is that it's not allowed to just do anything it wants because it feels like it. The mayor can't just do what the mayor wants. The governor can't just do what the governor wants. If the Constitution of Virginia has not given them that, pow that power, has not given them the authority to exercise a particular power, it can't be done in Virginia. And the U.S. is the same thing. We're going to see in the Constitution that it assigns some th roles to do to some folks, some branches, and then assigns other things, and then limits expressly some things and provides some things. And anybody who would exercise that power that goes contrary to the permission given in the Constitution is acting tyrannically. And so the founders were very careful about that, in Virginia particularly. Um, I, this something happened a few years back. They came up with a constitutional amendment so that to protect your rights to hunt and fish. Oh, yes, to protect your rights to hunt and fish. Well, it turns out, because we're all snoozing and watching TV and stuff, we didn't realize we already had the right to hunt and fish. And what had happened is the Constitution had never been given the government authority to police it. And so they actually increased, actually if you go read the Constitutional Amendment, it actually gave the General Assembly the power to legislate hunting and fishing. So when everybody protected the right to hunt and fish, they actually finally, somebody, somebody noticed, oh my goodness, we've been regulating this and we really never had the authority to do it. But everybody's been nice about it. You know, everybody's been paying their tickets and everything like that. So, but that was just the last, uh, I think about four, uh, 12, 12 years ago, I think that happened. I thought that was funny. And I, and I noticed it because I've been paying attention to this stuff. But a lot of things, um, in fact, you'll, you'll ask, they, you'll see some guys that are uh, a popular things. Some people have been telling me about it. I've seen a few of them. Is a thing where a guy is asked by a police officer to do something. And it's a law student. He says, well, you know, essentially, by what authority are you asking me to do that? And what it is is, what a mean, what a mean bad kid. Well, he's a run-amuck law student. He's trying to try this stuff out and see if it actually works. Well, sure enough, if the police officer's not given a lawful authority to do something, they really can't. So a lot of times they'll say, hey, may I have your whatever, or may I do the following thing? If you say yes, they're free to do it because you gave them the authority to do it. But other than that, if, if you're a law student who's trying to test this stuff out and say, wait a minute, I'm not going to let you do that unless you can show me by what authority. And then the policeman will just step back, and, you know, because they go, well, the guys read the rule book, and we all know that we really can't do anything without authority. So that's, that's not to make you have an upstart idea about, oh, what we can do, what the police can and can't do. It comes back to this idea of God has instituted government to be a minister of God for our good. And it can only use force in accordance with authority. So it's important for us to examine when we make government, are we giving the government the right authorities to fulfill their ministry? Are we giving them all the stuff that they really need? And are we being watchful to make sure we don't give them too much discretionary power where you might get some really wicked person in there runs amok? 
is there enough boundaries? Is, there, is the government limited from having somebody who has lost, who has fallen, a fallen man or woman, do the wrong thing? That's what the back, backdrop is with the theory of limited government. Any questions about that? Comments? I've scared you. None? Did I articulate it so well, or you just got the 230 feeling? You, you got articulated. Okay. Got very well. Good. Okay, separation of powers. Tell me about separation of powers. And, and now, Nick, you can say, or Ryan, but I'm going to call him Matthew later. I'm reserving. You can say something too, but separation of powers. What is the separation of power and why? Before I call on Isaac, come on. <clears throat> separation of power. What is it? What's the separation of power? What's the purpose? Have to take a guess. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, That's what I want you to do. Maybe you separate them. They keep each other in check so that one isn't more powerful than the other. Ah, oh, they call it the balance of power. Separation of power. It keeps each other in check. A lot of people don't realize that when Congress makes a law, the president actually doesn't have to obey it. Oh, caught that on tape. The president doesn't actually have to obey it. Why? Because the president doesn't know. The president, if he's got enough sense will certainly execute the law. They give an oath. I will faithfully execute the law. Okay? But, but he's got, an, and I'll tell you how this works, how the president could literally not obey Congress, not obey a court, and it has to do with separation of powers. Because the theory is, what if Congress is running amok, and all of a sudden the people went crazy and hired a bunch of pagans, and they didn't understand the law, and they did something crazy? Well, the president gave his oath not to Congress, but to the Constitution of the United States before God. So the president is accountable to God for his behavior, not the Congress. He's accountable to God for his behavior, not accountable to the Supreme Court. Now what will happen is the Supreme Court may differ from the president, and all y'all think, what a knucklehead president. Can he pay attention to what the Supreme Court just said? We're going to vote that person out of office. So they could only be a knucklehead for possibly a maximum of, you know, a, a few years. Okay? So separation of power is so that because the founders understood something very important, they understood that broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many go thereby. And narrow is the way that leads to life. Few there are who find it. They understood, and they came from a worldview that mankind is falling. And we're going to see something. I'm going to give you a reading assignment where you're going to see what they were reading from. Not, not from, yes, from the Bible, but from other people of their day that they were reading commentaries on laws of government. And it was from this perspective that men are fallen, that they, are, they are, have a tendency to do the wrong thing for their own gratification. Near-term gratification in spite of long-term consequences is what the tendency of mankind was. So they have this separation of powers, checks and balances. James Madison, I'm gonna quote James Madison sort of, uh, in the Federalist Papers when they were explaining why they had things set up the way they did. And he said it was ambition competing against ambition. And they understood that with passions and, and political influence and all this kind of stuff, you needed as much um, checks and balances as possible because the amount of force that a government has is just overwhelming. It's gonna, you know what I mean? You're just trying to get through your life and this powerful force now that has nuclear weapons, I mean, that's pretty powerful stuff, will tend to influence you ultimately negatively because men are fallen. So that was that. Now, there's a little quote there. Does anybody see the thing there? Everybody go to page 12. This was not the reading assignment. And the reason why I was trying to keep it light in the first week, because I'm going to be making you guys burn calories from here on out. On page 12, they have a comment there by Calvin Coolidge. I need a volunteer reader. It's on that left column, as I remember it. Volunteer reader? Or I'm going to have to call Courtney. Somebody volunteer. Come on. Matthew. Is it the American Tribune? Yes, Coolidge guy. Right there, right? 
the Where did you have Coolidge? Where's Coolidge? No, uh, that was we, the we, other Oh, page. no, no, no. Oh, was it? Page what seven. Page seven? Yeah, I was like, I don't see anything. Oh, what a stupid old. I don't see nothing over there. As they say in, in Japan. <laughs> Obviously. Okay, page seven, first column. Thank you, Matthew. Um, the meaning of America is not to be found in life without toil. Freedom is not only bought with a great price, it is maintained by unremitting effort. Unremitting effort. What is unremitting effort? Courtney. Um, you have to keep working for it. Keep working for it. Does that mean that you should join the military? Yes. It's not necessarily keep working for it, but keep exercising it and making sure that you protect it and ah. you still have it. Okay, so exercising it, use it or lose it. Okay, what's another unremitting effort? Now, joining the military and being part of the military is important because there is a certain you know, deadly force necessary sometimes in the <coughs> fallen world. Hopefully you're, you're doing the right thing. You know? yeah. Now, what, what's another unremitting effort besides exercising, use it or lose it? Right. And homeschoolers should be aware of that. When somebody who's getting federal welfare benefit money to create, uh, now they may have other motives, okay, they may have really good motives, but I've actually seen somebody who had their family disturbed because there was a lady who was having her friend make false claims against people. So that would increase her caseload. Her pay was directly related to her caseload. This was in Florida a few years back. She ended up going to jail. There were something like 90 cases that were created by false phone calls. So if you know your rights and you know the wrongs and somebody comes up to your door with a sheriff next to them and says, I'm here to interview your children, they very well may be exercising a power that is well beyond any authority that they have. And if you say, oh my goodness, I don't know really what the rules are here and let them in, and, you know, lest they blow your door down, you may reap consequences. That it may not just be for your convenience. Well, if I let them in, it won't go bad for me. Yeah, but what about the next family? So, I mean, that's a weird thing you see in homeschool legal defense that you have to worry about. Just wait at the door and call HSLDA. You know, they'll give you a little procedure. We'll talk to them, but don't let them in. You know, and they might, so there's, there's, that would be an example, a scary example for homeschoolers of an unremitting effort. And is, is that to defy authority? No. It's to hold you and them accountable to the lawful godly authority that he's created, that he's used, that he's implemented in our country, in our state, in Virginia, in this commonwealth. So it's an unremitting effort. In fact, it's uncomfortable. And people might even accuse you, oh, why didn't you just submit to that authority? They were actually, but they were exercising power, but they didn't have the authority. And it's very hard for people to understand. We have an obligation to hold ourselves accountable to the law and those who are exercising power. We've got to do it very carefully. Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael tried to hold the king accountable to the law. Well, you know, the king wanted to have his way. And there was many times God, well, actually every time, God saved them. And even in one case, they put themselves subject to the king to where they were going to go be thrown in the fiery furnace. But they would not violate that command that would defy God, that would be outside his authority. He had the authority to throw them in the fire, okay? He was a king, but he didn't have the authority to ask them to forsake God. That's the difference. Any questions or comments on that? All right? All right. Now, everybody go to page 12. This is scary. I'm going to have to figure out a better way to get you guys to talk. Page 12. Now, this one is Theodore Roosevelt. You got one there, Jason? Yes. Read the thing from Theodore Roosevelt. Americanism means the virtues of courage, honor, justice, truth, sincerity, and hardihood. The virtues that will destroy America are, are blah, 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 prosperity at any price, uh, peace at any price, safety, first instead of duty first, the love of soft living, and the get-rich-quick theory of life. Wow. I thought that was profound. Has anybody seen any examples of that? Look that over. What kind of examples 
do we see today in the thing? <coughs> Teddy Roosevelt. Yes, Matthew, you're free to talk. Yes, what are you going to say, Hunter? Um, I have an example of the things that will destroy America and the peace that ending Christ. We as a society of Christians, a community of Christians, have gotten to the point where we are hesitant to engage in situations that would make us seem maybe confrontational, such as with um, uh, in, in popular culture. We, we don't have a very big presence in popular culture because we seem, it seems to be confrontational to us. And we need, we say, God's the God of peace. So we need to stay at peace with everyone. Okay. And what, what does scripture say that we ought to do? Always give a reason for the hope that is in you. Always given a reason for the account, uh, or always give an account for the hope that is in you. That's one example. Let your light so shine among men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You know? So, yeah, good. Thank you, Hunter. Anybody else? What's another example of things that Theodore Roosevelt said? There. You can look at it. It's got a little list. Uh, love of soft living. Love of soft living. That's all around us today. Yes. Yes. My love of soft living is, you know, I'll admit it. I'm going to have a therapy session. World of tanks. <laughs> so, yes. sorry. But, uh, no, I'm being facetious. The... Uh, Soft living, a love of soft living. And you're right, you would rather not be confrontational. You know how much work it is to actually find out? We're going to see this uh, uh, in a couple of weeks. There's an assignment I'm going to give you where this Sir William Blackstone says, when people get ambitious, they got some money, they got some time in their hands, they get some gray hair, they like to go off and be in the legislature. And so he tells all the things they're not supposed to do. And what you see today in our pol political situation most of the people in the legislature, we see them doing what Sir William Blackstone said not to do. But he said, we're there to do a more important work, he says, is to check and avert every dangerous innovation. To check and avert, to dodge every dangerous innovation. That means you've got to watch every single bill that's coming up. And look, and 90% of it might be looking really good because there's this really key thing that they want to get in there, and you didn't notice it. Okay. So, and we'll have some examples of why the Virginia Constitution says certain things in Article 4 that other states aren't paying attention to, but it really go to this point of not being complacent, being very, and it gives you maybe them an ability to be a little bit more careful in examining some of the things that are coming up. A little unremitting effort. Okay, any questions or comment on that? Okay, now again, this is supposed to be inspirational, a little bit motivational. Um, okay, now, this is something that, that I, I think is a running theme, and I, I think it's very important. What, and let me just tell you, I think it was about 15, 16 years ago, I used to think to myself, uh, wow, it's longer, okay, 18 years ago, I used to think to myself, what's with these bunch of tax Evaders. I mean, that's weren't the, all these guys were talking about this patriotism. All these guys are doing, they're throwing tea in the in the harbor. Uh, they're whining about paying a tax because on paper, um, you know, no taxation without representation. Ah, la 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 la. Why didn't they just submit at the time to the governing authority? You know, what makes them special? What would make and and even the fact that I used to think, well. What gives us the right to figure out what we think is the right form of government? So is there any justification biblically, any justification biblically for you, we the people, government of the people, by the people, and for the people, to create a government by your own hands, get together little committees and write a constitution and send people to Philadelphia? Is there any authority in scripture? What scripture could support y'all doing that? Y'all is you guys in California. <laughs> what would it, what scripture would support? Is it possible that we've created this government of the people, by the people, and for the people without the proper authority? What gives you the authority scripturally? I feel like you know the answer to this. I do. That's so easy. It's scary. 
No. <laughs> You're cracking me Jesus up. Jesus left. <laughs> okay. Is there anything that it would be? I just uh, actually I hadn't thought of this, but until just now, Ecclesiastes twelve thirteen and fourteen. You know, um, he said, "Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. For God, um, fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will judge every secret thing, whether it be good or evil." And I, I didn't quote it correctly, but there's this there's this principle, obviously, to love God. We've got an obligation scripturally to love God. Okay, and because we love God, we obey His commands. One of the commands, he said, was submit to the authorities, that these authorities were appointed by God, etc. But there's another thing that, that Jesus reiterated, the two greatest commandments. What were the two greatest commandments? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. So ultimately, when you step back, and, and some of these things we're going to see in government, that the history of American law and government comes on these two points. To love God, and because we love God, a lot of the uh, founders were trying to convince people why government was important to do it um, the way they were doing it, because each person that had the personal uh, self-gratification motive would be gratified. It'd be best for their happiness and safety. But those who had a Christian worldview, to love God and love your neighbor as yourself, that we have a duty to our neighbor to protect our neighbor's property. What's the best way to protect our neighbor's property? Well, it's good to be my neighbor because I've been working on my jujitsu. So my, my neighbor can be well protected in their <laughs> happiness and safety as long as I'm around and nobody has any firearms that comes at them, right? But it may not be the best way to do it because I'm a little bit squeamish when it comes to lead things flying in the air. So it may be that there's a better way to protect. So really what motivates us to set up government is to do it because we love God and we're obligated to his rules and then we're going to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're going to come up with our good sense, the gifts that God has given us, acting in our particular gifting, and come up with a plan that would protect property, life, liberty, and property. So you're going to see that theme running through American law and government. It's protect life, liberty, your freedom to speak and all those, and freedom to worship God and to practice what he gives you. And so life, liberty and property we've heard the term life liberty and pursuit of happiness well actually pursuit of happiness happens to be a property right so life liberty and property we are here and because we love god and love our neighbor as ourselves, we've instituted government to protect everybody's life liberty and their property okay so those things and it's in that order life first then once you're alive your liberty and once you have your liberty because if your life or liberty are taken, there's damage that are done that you can't sue anybody for a million dollars for. It just won't make up for it. Life and liberty. Now, property is the third thing because you can sue somebody for a million dollars and they took 500000 you get a million and you're happy. Okay? It's your happiness and safety. So, so that's kind of an intro to this class. And now what we're going to do is, and, and I just want to give you a perspective of what government is about. That's what the founders understood. And you're going to see things of what they said and, and just understand that they were reading the Bible, that they had read what Jesus said. And I'm going to hand you something today. It's going to be this week's assignment. You're going to read something that the founders were reading. It was written in 1766. So 10 years prior to the revolution, nine years prior to, to the things that were going on, that you're going to see what they were reading. So I'm going to hand that out. Now, are there any questions so far about what I've talked about? In your introduction to American government. Questions over here. Okay. Be ready next time. Now, if anybody's good at this, it'd be great. These are huge. This is pages one through twenty. Yeah, and I didn't have an administrator. I'll just we can take. Yeah. So this is what you're gonna do. Take twenty. And take ten, 10 pages because it's two sides, and pass it down. In fact, I could cut it in half and set it like in the back row. Which page is this? Page five, three, two, oh, oh. give me two more pages off the bottom. And that's page one? Okay. 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 Okay.
Okay. She's got a stapler. Got a stapler. Take ten pages and pass it down. Because if ten pages, I have twenty, right? Look on your syllabus, your silly booze. Now the whole purpose of today was really I'm just blasting you with my my political theory. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself goes far. Explains the common law. You don't have to have it written down. You still obey the law because you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what it all wraps up in. Okay, what you're going to do is you look on your syllabus because today is read chapter one, complete the section review. We talked about what the Bible says about the purposes of government, the minister of God for our good, and we're the ones who frame the current governments we live in. And uh, oh, I ended with a preposition. I'll have to work on that. We're going to. The whole purpose was to think about this whole um, loving God, loving your neighbor as yourself. And that's why we have such a vital, it's so vitally important for us to maintain government properly. Now, in your syllabus, section two, authority by design is what I called it. The textbook calls their chapter something else. So you're going to read chapter two, pages 15 through 26, and then complete review section 2.1, 2.2. We're going to take chapter two and divide it into two weeks into two weeks. And what I'm also going to give you to read is Sir William Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England, Introduction the Second, Section the Second, that's why they used their words there, they said Section the Second, of the nature of laws in general. That's imperative for you to read that. And what I'd like you to do on this Sir William Blackstone Commentaries on the laws, on the nature of law in general, I want you to go through it, and when you see something that you're like, oh, that's hard hitting, that is a maxim of law and government that I want to remember. Or if there's something that you're like, ooh, I recommend, I remember that in the Declaration of Independence, or something, or oh, that's right out of the Bible. As you're reading it, kind of circle it, make a little note. Why was that, what, what struck you about that? Oh, I've read that before. Or oh, I saw that in the Bible. Something like that, okay? Because we're actually going to take two weeks. The second week, we're actually, I'm going to give you an assignment on it. But this week, you're supposed to read it because it's going to matter with what we talk about next week. So that's the thing I hand out. Did anybody not get the Sir William Blackstone's commentaries besides Anna? Okay, everybody's got one. Well, uh, what's that? I don't think it's finished going around. It hasn't? No, it's not finished going around. Oh, and you didn't raise your hand? See, that's what I'm dealing with. Um, I think I even saw this out. Okay. You get a silly boost? Who else doesn't have a silly boost? Okay, that's it. And then what we're going to do, we're going to take next chapter and we're going to divide it up into two because the following week we're going to discuss communism. Oh, I'm dreading communism. Oh. Our kids love communism. What is it? So we'll see what it is and what it isn't. And that's it. Thank you. Dismissed. It would be a better Oh my goodness, you're quoting John Locke, because men are vicious, corrupt, and degenerate. We have judges. <laughs> Among other things. Well, on a, I answered the question for the government thing, I couldn't find a scripture that specifically said the first the government, so I thought about what God did, and how he didn't put government, he just put judges just to like fix it. And so I came to the conclusion that government was put in place so that the righteous and the unrighteous can live together and someone holds the unrighteous in check. Oh, that's beautiful. How come you didn't say that in class? Just because it's raining. No, that wasn't even profane. That was profound. That was really good. No, it was. It was, Isaac. That, and I wish you had said that because that's a very near thing. Did you write that down? Okay. Yes. Yes. No, I forgot. It, it matters. I didn't understand it.